known as Ram. I've I work with ThoughtWorks. Um, I've been a dev. I've worked for quite a few years in the infrastructure space. I enjoy build and release engineering. I enjoy a lot of infrastructure automation. And um, I actually don't say that I'm a DevOps person because you know that's unfortunately badly overloaded nowadays. Um, but I work a lot. I do a lot of bridging work between people playing various roles. Uh, hi, I'm Prasanna, and I've been a pet tester for around 12 years now, and right now work for ThoughtWorks. And uh, my primary role is to ensure that the code is that we deploy as organization remains secure. That's the shortest introduction of me. Yeah. And what happens? What's happening right now is uh, between Prasanna and I, we work with a number of ThoughtWorks clients. And we help them in the continuous delivery journey. We help, uh, so I'm a security enthusiast. I'm nowhere close to the kind of stuff that people like Prasanna do. And a lot of what we are going to present here are lessons that we have learned. Uh, excuse me, lesson. Can you hear me still? <coughs> I don't think it's for this, I guess. Yeah. OK, thank you. So yes, folks, this is primarily what we're going to talk about. How does security fit into continuous delivery? Right? So quick recap for all of us. Continuous delivery is, yes, there is a book. But is, this is what is the essence. How do you make sure that you have working code, reliable code, out in production? Right? And how do you make sure that you can deploy frequently? and that you can get value earlier, uh, usually in weeks rather than in months. So it is, uh, you know, the previous speaker mentioned about Amazon deploying every 11.1 or X seconds. Yes, uh, those are different parts of the overall segment, but how do they make it all work together? This is something that a lot of businesses are out exploring right now, because they invest a lot of money into software development, and they would rather realize the benefits of it earlier than later. Right? Yeah. Um, people like me are called in at such times. We have, because we've been devs, we've written a lot of, we test drive all the time. Uh, we do a lot of infrastructure automation. And at ThoughtWorks, we believe very, very, very much in automating a whole lot of things. So th these are the areas that we usually end up focusing on. Okay? Uh, everyone wants the build to be faster. You want lesser red builds. It's a popular topic on one of our projects. And uh, uh, you start doing things like you say, hey, QAs don't have to be enemies of devs. And you know, uh, we go about changing the KPIs of various teams. A lot of these are actually people level problems. They are, the technology is a very small bit of it. Right? And uh, one of the things that we end up doing is we also work with broad teams and say, can you share with us what security settings and you know, infrastructure configurations you have so that we can get it all the way back to development? And we try to eliminate scenarios like when devs say, but it works in my environment. It works in my laptop. Why doesn't it work somewhere else? I don't know. So we try to do, we try to cut out a lot of those things. Right? Now, one of the topics that's usually not very much covered is that of security. The way security is seen is uh, you usually leave this, it's considered a painful process. Business, of course, say security is very important, no one wants to lose revenue. You don't want to have scenarios like, um, actual scenarios, someone adds, say, $500 worth of goods to a shopping cart, they navigate all the way to paying the credit card, they go open the shopping cart again, add some more goods, and they come back and pay for this $500, and they get thousands of dollars free. So we've actually had to help with customers in scenarios like this. Right? Uh, so business understands, you know, it's all about revenue. They have financial and legal ramifications to take care of. And as a consequence, everyone says, hey, security is important. And this is what security ends up being for a lot of teams. It becomes, oh, I've got the green bar. You know? uh, we have a sign off. It is stuff like you have to have separations of responsibilities. It's, it's just a lot of this, you know, uh, all these uh, very novice level statements and uh, people with a lot of tags and uh, gatekeepers and whatnot. So we have to deal with all of this stuff. And this is what it ends up being. It's 
it's usually just considered a lot of drama and you know all about nothing. One of one of the kind of things that we showcase to our clients is a demo that we're going to showcase to you a little later today in this talk, right? Um, some very quick things, right? Um, we end up dealing with all these uh, people playing these various roles, and we usually have to deal with whatever they say. It's usually a good relationship because if something goes bad, they are the ones who first get fired. The, the unfortunate things that we've seen at Target and such is one example. People who did the right due diligence, but you know, there was a crack somewhere and someone broke in, and usually these are the people who are held accountable and responsible. Right? Security advisors, well-meaning people, we work with them a lot. Pen testers, unfortunately, they're not part of teams, and that's what we're going to argue that you want them part of your teams. And auditors, sounds very, you know, they are also very traditional minded people and uh, when people like me have to work with them and say, you know, I'm on your side, I finished automating it all, here's your report. We then get into different questions like whoever asked you to run it. So, <laughs> yes. So, these are the people that we have to uh, work with. This is something that I have figured out is ideal to explain to dev teams. What is security? It's not just a buzzword, it's not just that you know, uh, the green part of the browser. It's not just some auditor sitting somewhere. For a lot of people, all of these things end up being the same. They, they just think that these are all you know, synonymous with each other. So this is an example that we use to explain to people that we all understand passwords, we use them. So this is how we explain passwords and all these things to people. Now why am I having this slide here? We are having this slide because um, of this point, defense and depth. We usually, uh, let me go to the earlier slide, okay? We usually have to deal with scenarios where, uh, when I explain to a developer that, hey look, you know, we've got to have this setting, we have to have SE Linux enabled, or we have to have that automation in place. I usually have to deal with questions like, oh, if someone broke into your net network, you already have bigger problems. You know, uh, the problem with bigger problems is, that ends up being a very strong word which takes discussion away from a lot of good work you can do at the ground level, right? For example, this is, this is an example that I use with a lot of people. Would you just leave all your valuables lying right next to the front door just because it has a lock? You would not. You would have, you'd have a separate room with a cupboard, with a safe in it, and you keep all your valuables over there. If you would do that, why would you do the same with your solutions, right? The next important thing that we usually advise all our customers and our teams and client dev teams is to bear in mind these two points, traceability and auditability. Do you know where that code came from? Do you know where that jar or you know deployable artifact came into production? This is interesting and important. There are, there are times when you know we all apply those hot patches, right? Hot fixes. Yes, you should be applying package manage, you know, you should use package managers and everything. This is what people usually talk about. This is what's written in the document. But more often than not, it's someone who just opens up a text editor or SCPs a bunch of files in the production, reloads a web logic or Ruby server or whatever. Right? These are the kind of questions that we usually have our teams answer. Can you tell where this came from? And I'm talking over here, this is more about code, but think about what happens with a lot of this Docker images and you know vagrant images and stuff. Do you actually know where they came from? Do you know who created it? Do you know what process they followed? Did they replace that kernel over there? I have I work with some clients where because of their realities, I cannot talk about it much. They have scenarios where the kernels are modified. OpenSSL libraries are all changed. They have their own, you know, intrusion detection systems and whatnot. But the first time I got into the boxes, I said, wow, no proper commercial software company whose tech stacks I might have to deploy here is going to really agree with all this. So in this case, we had to dig a lot and we had to be reassured, yes, they have done the right stuff. But if you just were to go and take a random Amazon AMI and just set up your entire business on it, do you know where that came from? Right? These are questions we have teams answer. Because 
this is the truth about the cloud. It's just someone else's server. It's not that magical machine that you know you just click a button and you see a row that's saying VM provision. This is this is a very important message we have to keep giving to people. And this is what we end up talking about. That it's actually all these layers. It's not just your SSL thing, right? Uh, we don't have too much time actually, and that's something we're painfully conscious of. So we are happy to discuss a lot of these things in the open space. Uh, actual scenarios we have dealt with. You, ha you do all the right kind of hardening, and then one fine day you discover that your database's IP has just been stolen by some other computer. Right? It's an app poisoning attack. A lot of devs do not know about this. What happens in that five minutes when that IP has gone away and has been given back to you? Right? Someone could have just snapped, sniffed all that and cracked puzzles. Uh, or deciphered a lot of stuff. Server hardware. Yes, you have all the biggest end of security, but one fine day a technician walks in, removes a hard disk drive because it's faulty, plugs in another thing and goes away with that hard disk drive. Who looks at all this? What about data at rest? Right? Operating system stuff. I already mentioned things like patch kernels and whatnot. Tech stack. How many of us actually keep track of the gems that we have gone and inlined into our code? Uh, I've actually had to answer, you know, be part of discussions where people say, I don't have to update this gem. You know, it's frozen. What does that mean? Right? People, I've, I've had to be part of situations where they think, because I finished downloading it, and because I put it into a directory and I marked it read only, I'm secure right now. Or I've had to be part of discussions where someone says, of course this gem is secure. I got it from GitHub. <laughs> so, okay. Who keeps track of the tech stack? The, these are real problems to look at. It's not just about writing cool code right, and making it look like poetry. And then comes the application layer, which is where really you know, we want uh, Prasna to talk about his stuff. So just before we dive into the real demo, uh, to quickly tell you, we in some of our projects, we are in a situation where we, we work in environments where all other projects have to follow a waterfall process. They have to freeze everything. Auditors and external pen testers are called in, and they analyze everything. You know, they they will analyze all the code, and there are separate roles uh, deploying and whatnot. But in our case, we are right now in positions with these same customers where we are able to go live every week. Right? That's because we have been able to demonstrate that whatever hardening we do in production is the same that we have in our vagrant boxes. Whatever. Um, Every time we deploy our app, we run the entire hardening as well, just to ensure that things are in place. Right? So we use mechanisms like these to make sure that we are able to go live every week without having to have external pen testers and auditors come in and certify it all. Because instead of them certifying artifacts, they ended up certifying our processes. And when we are able to show consistently that we stick to that process, is thoroughly audited, we have traceability and auditability all the way from code to prod and prod back to code. Uh, we are able to go live very regularly. Uh, Prasanna, next. Yeah. Uh, actually, over to Prasanna. Uh, hello. Thank you, Ram. Uh, so, like Ram explained, all the processes, this, where I come in is uh, where application comes into place. I basically ensure that the applications are secure. That's where predominantly our job is. Uh, breaking it down, what, like Ram's explained, we don't commit at the end at all. So today, uh, I'm part of the teams. Uh, I pen test right now when the functions get delivered as fast as possible. We do have automations in place. If you have seen in the previous one, some of the low hanging fruits are automatically taken care of. So some of the tools that we use are Breakman and Zap. He talked about uh, rubies, uh, wherein what happens if your ruby gems are being bought in? We, the reason is we don't want to concentrate as we, as a pen tester, I want to concentrate on the real bugs. I don't want to spend my time finding out if the uh, gem is having a problem or not. This is where Breakman comes into play. It automatically checks, it has a repository, it keeps reporting itself. It is going to tell me whether, as people write. So the beauty of it is, it, as someone checks in, if there is a vulnerability on one of the gems, it will break the mint. And it will say that you need to fix this. And then immediately an email is sent out, we know where some things are happening. Same with, uh, today we can go to the next extent, right? You write a basic SQL injection. Uh, I'm sure most of you know what is a SQL injection. I'm not going to go deep into it. 
But let's say there is a SQL injection. Someone writes a dynamic query and writes that one to the code. It will break. These are low hanging fruits. We don't want a pen tester to be looking at it, spending his time on finding lower issues. We want him to spend time to find the real issues, the issues that would really bring an impact to that organization. Uh, we, as a part of the demo, I'll look at some of the ones where you need a pen tester to be uh, manually doing some of these tests and to ensure that the code is secure. Some of it should be automated, ensure that the low hanging fruits are taken care of. So you don't worry about it. Let's try and see if I can show both of them today. <laughs> Uh, testers, my predominant job is basically to break uh, applications, but we also, like we talked about infrastructure, we also look at scenarios where, hey, can we use the infrastructure to hack into the applications itself? And we do look at it, but uh, like Ram said, because these are certified every week, we keep a track of what is the changes that are happening. Any piece of change, would it respect to infrastructure, any change, will it make a difference? And if it is, then we pen test it manually to see it. Otherwise, we don't look at it. Uh, this is a very personally a beautiful word that I like, speed versus stealth. When I, speed everyone knows, DevOps I'm sure you know what is the speed of things that we go. There, when I use the word stealth, what I really mean here is, what are the sneakiest bugs possible? Do you need to know all your infrastructure? Uh, stealth here is basically saying, uh, as a pen tester you like to be stealth. Stealth is something nobody should know. Uh, personally as my human tendency I'd like to be hidden, uh, nobody should me. But, so, you <laughs> <laughs> so that's a general idea is find out the real most important issues that are there and that's what uh, a pen tester's goal should be. He should not be spending his time finding out a very trivial bug. He should be there to use his expertise to be saying this bug would cause an impact for you. Uh, let me quickly go into a demo, uh, try and explain you. Uh, how, so one example of one of the, why a pen tester comes in, uh, why automation would fail in this specific one. This demo idea of this one is, uh, I can just execute it. So, this one is a, a very bare minimum, uh, can you see the screen there? I'm just, please. Uh, we'll just take a 30 second break, that's nice. It will be optimal if you use this. Hello? Yes. Sorry guys. Uh, if you look at it, this is a very simple example. Can you all see the text uh, from the back? Uh, I'm just going to copy the links as we're going to say. It's a simple one. It looks like it's a login. It takes a user ID and a password. The target of this test is that you have to become administrator. Let me tell you what is expected of you also. Uh, you try logging in with this. It says try harder. Uh, someone who's done an OSCP would know what a try harder is. It's a very catchy phrase to do something. It's a little show off. Uh, now, it also has another functionality called register. So, if you look at it, you can actually register users here. So, let's try registering a user. I am so sorry. <laughs> it says, Admin is already registered. You cannot register an admin. But if you have to become an administrator, how do you do this? Let's do one thing. Some of the known tools for SQL injection happens to be a tool called SQL Map. How many of you have heard of SQL Map? Okay, I see a few of fans. Uh, it's a good tool. It's an amazing, one of the best tools available today to break into a SQL injection or you want to find out SQL injection based attacks. So just so the reason I kept it as a URL is it's very easy to run SQL map with a URL. Just hyphen U and put the URL there. Are you able to see? No, no. Come on. Come on. Yeah, that's what I do. So if you see here, 
Python hyphen SQL map. We're gonna hit it. Hit enter. It tries everything. It basically tells that the user parameter is not injectable. So if you run these tools, it would actually say, hey, looks like you're not injectable to SQL injection. You are safe. And the other tool that is generally advised is Zap2. Uh, a lot of it's an amazing tool. I'm personally a lot of believer of Zap is a great tool. You run it through this, it does not find any SQL injection. All it finds us is three issues, which says that X frame options, X frame options, if someone would know what it is, stops an attack called uh, click jacking. Uh, and some of the it stops an XSS. So it basically said that three parameter header based systems are missing. That's it. It did not know anything about how I could become an admin or how I could do a SQL injection in this case. Now let me just go a little ahead and actually perform the attack. Uh, what I'm going to do is if you look at the admin, you make it bigger. Um, I will just I will do it. What I'm going to do is enter this as a username. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, X. I have actually created a user admin space 10 spaces put an X and then I have put a password saying 12345 your admin effectively it bypassed the system the reason why this happened was MySQL has a bug the MySQL has something called a truncation system what it effectively means is if your column size is defined as 10, anything above that will be dropped. And the other major issue with uh, MySQL was it uses a binary search. It effectively means admin is equal to admin space. So if you notice what I did was I created a user admin space 10 characters and I put the X. I counted 10 because the column value was 10. It becomes admin space, the last x is dropped off by the MySQL itself. So if you look at the table at this point of time, there have been an admin user which we do not have the password to. But the uh, user that we created this time was admin space. And what we are looking is, get me all users who are admin. Then the system thinks admin and admin space are same. This is where you run any amount of your tools, it would not have been detected by it. Because this is something that you need to have inherent knowledge of how MySQL works. This is one of the examples that we wanted to say is you need to have a pen tester to look at these kind of specific problems. Think what is the problem at that hand and specifically attack it. And use your systems to automate to pick up all your small things and let you fix not just the small things. See, if you look at it, SQL injection is a serious bug. Your general SQL injections can be taken care of with Breakman itself. But with specific scenarios like these, you need to have a pen tester there. What actually happens today is the organization that I work with is today developers start thinking, hey, what would a pen tester think? I'm part of the discussions as the code gets developed. Uh, there are scenarios where uh, as the code gets developed, we discuss, okay, if this is the scenario, what would be the things that we would exploit into the system? Those were the things that we were talking about, wherein we're saying, your security guy should not come at the end wherein your decisions could be really risky. There have been instances where I have broken into a system where there has been a design flaw. What happens when you have a design flaw? You need to go rewrite your piece of code and it could be a very costly, your dates get shifted out, you cannot deploy at the time that you want and those are the problems. So it's better to bring your pen testers also into your system at this immediate point itself. Someone who can be your, uh, who can walk with you as you build your code. 
so you want to continue on that? I just just to just to show you some things. Prasna, what was your what was your title? I just told you. Huh. If you see here, the actual admin is here. That's the actual admin, which I did not have the password. But the new user that I created, admin12345, you see here, admin, it's followed with a lot of space. I put an X at the end of it that has been truncated. And that's why you don't see the X there. Because the column length was exactly 10 characters. And that's why I was counting the numbers. Now, automation in our line here would be, we don't do this, autom we don't check it. Aut I write Python scripts to see, basically, to see how many numbers. It's not necessarily 10. Here I knew, so I counted the number. Otherwise, it's just a Python script that I would have written. That's why automation as a pen tester is something that we do. OK? Yes. Okay, folks. Uh, hello. Okay. Never mind. So I'll, I'll just speak out aloud. So the thing is, uh, what we have learned is it's not just enough. You just you know find some commercial open source tools and just stick them in there and say the tool said so. It's actually much more. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it's it's not just as dumb and simple as just install a few tools and declare it's done. Or say that because the tool told me there were just these three, that's all that there is. If you would have seen, uh, the kind of issue that Prasna highlighted was not reported by the existing tool at all. Right? Now, this is, this is one of our key messages. Uh, uh, for a lot of, I, I usually have to deal with this, uh, even with a lot of thought workers, that we know how fast we are, we know how quickly we are able to deliver functionality, it looks good. And you know the showcases went so well, and then there's some other team who comes in and says, "Sorry, I can't let you deploy it because I got my process." We sometimes have to. It's it's very painful for us even to deploy security fixes or functional fixes, right? And then when people like us come in and say, "Guys, look, you know, I know we did all these things, but we gotta have a manual pen test in place." Usually we are told, "No, but that's not continuous delivery," and then we have to remind them that. Just because you have a deployable package does not mean you keep deploying it continuously, right? There's a lot of other due diligence you have to do as well, okay? And uh, this is one other thing we have to do, right? Remind everyone that, guys, a tool cannot take a human's place. A tool will not know that, you know, what else are you doing? What, how else can your domain logic be circumvented? And um, that's, that's, these are all the really tough conversations that we have to have. I guess uh, we have nothing. Any? We have done. The yeah, we are kind of done. We actually had a whole. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, thanks. Um, we are open. Uh, we will keep an open space, and you could discuss it if you want more, some more attacks. So, uh, thank you. I just, I just wanted to add, when we, when we do these kind of showcases, people ask us, you know, maybe you do not use the latest operating system or the latest fixes. Just so you know, we actually set up this virtual machine last night on just to prove, just to establish that this is the latest. So if you see this, this is with this is the log within you know the Ubuntu LTS release where it has been published on this particular date. And uh, I mean it has been set up on this date, it was published yesterday night. We in set it up yesterday night. So this is not Canonical's fault, or they are not fools and all this. It's just that you have to be cognizant of all such things. Just want to clarify that. Okay, we're done. Okay.